So uh, I will turn it over to you. All right. Hello, everyone. We'll uh, do a sh share screen here and uh, get this started. All right. Hopefully, everyone can see the, uh, the slides. I yes. said, my name is Sal Shabetta. I'm uh, here on behalf of Texas Turtles, which is a uh, conservation group here in Texas. So just get started. A little introduction. First, I want to tell you a little bit more about who I am. Uh, like she said, I've been working with turtles, you know, since, you know, I was a little kid. This is me down here at uh, eight years old with a box turtle. Um, I still, you know, so started out really young. And uh, I was at uh, Montgomery Zoo in the education department and then San Antonio Zoo and reptiles and then uh, Animal World and Snake Farm as a reptile manager for a few years. So I've been working with reptiles and turtles pretty much most of my life. Um, going into the rest of the presentation, what I'm gonna talk about is do a little overview of what Texas Turtles is. And then we're gonna talk about what are turtles? It seems like an easy question, but the easy questions always have the hard answers. And now I'm gonna go into the diversity that we have here in Texas. And then, you know, you unfortunately today, can't do a nature presentation without talking about the challenges we got. And unfortunately, turtles got a lot of them. So on that, you know, what Texas Turtles is, we are a nonprofit. Uh, our motto is we're filling a Texas-sized hole in our knowledge of Texas turtles. You know, we think we know a lot about turtles, and then we're learning so much new stuff as we're out studying them in the field. We're finding them in places. We didn't expect them to be. We're finding them in numbers we didn't expect. We're learning new behaviors and all this. And the more we study these animals, the more we're finding out new things about them. So what Texas Turtles is focused on is conservation of our native turtles, uh, learning about the ecology, natural history, and then something like this is the education. Started out as a website in 2007 uh, by our president, Carl Franklin. We became an official nonprofit in 2019. Now our official staff or the board is only these four people, but we also have a bunch of what we affectionately know as turtle nerds that help us at surveys around the state. Now these people that help us out, there are other zookeepers, there are veterinary technicians, there are veterinarians, uh, there are college researchers, professors, and they're even just private individuals. And we've even had other naturalists come out and help with some of these surveys. In fact, uh, you might have seen uh, one of the ads for the survey I'm putting on here in uh, Converse. Unfortunately, the weather hasn't been very cooperative, but uh, as soon as it starts to uh, stabilize and cool down a little bit, then I'll be able to get these uh, surveys going on again, and we can have people come out and help with those surveys as well. So what are turtles? Now, like you said, easy questions have difficult answers. The evolutionary history of turtles is confusing. We really don't know who they're related to. Initially, I love this chart. If you, if, for those of you who can see the chart, it's, it's kind of hard to realize, but uh, as a herpetologist, we always love pointing this one out, you know, that, that birds are really reptiles. So a lot of ornithologists kind of, I don't like that, but if birds are reptiles, so deal with it. But uh, you see here that it's kind of hard to see, but turtles has a dotted line. That means we really don't know where they fit in evolutionarily. Originally, it was thought they were part of this para-reptile group, which is an extinct pre-reptiles. These weren't really reptiles, but they were going to be in the future. But now we're starting with genetics, we're starting to see, well, maybe they're related to the crocodile and bird line. So they come out here with the archosaurs. But then there's some other genetics that says, no, they're more down here with the lizards. And there's still another one that says, well, maybe they might be related to these plesiosaurs or the, uh, the aquatic reptiles uh, that, have, that are now extinct. So simply, we really don't know who these guys are related to. What we do know is probably the most ancient proto-turtle. His name is Popocellus, and he was found about 240 million years ago. So it's a pretty old turtle. These, so they were starting to become turtles 
right at the same time the dinosaurs were starting to become dinosaurs. Now, at about 200 million years, we see the first turtle, where you anybody can look at that fossil and say, yep, that's a turtle. So that was about 200 million years. So for 200 million years, we've had these turtles. Now, bio, turtle biology, I could literally do an entire presentation on turtle biology. It is so fascinating. You look down here at the picture of the skeleton. A lot of, some people think, unfortunately, that, you know, turtles are like hermit crabs. They can crawl out of their shell and go find a bigger one. That's not true. Turtles, skeletons are their shell. Their, their shell is living. The covering is a uh, keratin, just like your fingernails, underneath, oh, overlaying uh, living bone. And that bone, the top part of their shell is called the carapace. The bottom is the plastron. The carapace is actually made up of, you can see here in the picture, it's spine. The spinal cord, the backbone, is part of the shell. The part that makes the plates are actually expanded ribs. Now we think what makes the plastron or the belly part is uh, what's called expanded gastralia, which are basically uh, stomach bones. If you look at some of the dinosaurs, some of the big dinosaurs, they'll have like, look like little rib bones on the bottom. They think these are the, the turtles expanded those to become the plastron. Now the coolest thing, and I love telling people this because it's just so fascinating, the turtles shoulder girdle is inside the rib cage. So ours, well, we don't really have a shoulder girdle, but like our collarbones and all that obviously are on the outside. Theirs are actually inside their rib cage. You can kind of see it right here. So these, these bones here are the ribs basically. And this is their shoulder girdle right here. So it's inside their ribs. Very fascinating. Now, probably one of the most common questions I get asked about turtles. What's the difference between a turtle, a tortoise, and a terrapin? Simple answer, what country are you in? Because those answers are going to be different if you're in, from England, or if you're from Australia, or if you're from the United States. Since we're in the U.S., we'll go with what we call turtles, tortoises, and terrapin. Turtles are usually semi-aquatic. They usually have a flatter shell, and they have flatter, sometimes webbed feet. Tortoises are gonna have, usually have more of a rounded shell, more dome-like. They're gonna have these more elephant-like or columnar feet. And uh, they're also usually mostly herbivorous. Now I keep saying usually because it's nature. There's very rarely anything that's all. Here's one thing with turtles though. They all lay eggs. No turtle has live birth, they all lay eggs. Now, a terrapin is a brackish water turtle. There's actually only one species of terrapin. Uh, we do have one here on the Texas coast. I'll talk about that later. Um, and it's, it's a brackish water turtle. But uh, so that's what we call a turtle, tortoise, and a terrapin. Now, like the old coin adage, all tortoises are turtles, but not all turtles are tortoises. So it's kind of kind of confusing that way. A couple of the quick biology things that I've skipped over. Like I said, they're all lay egg layers. One important thing that's going to come up for them is they are what's called temperature sex determinant. It's a really cool thing. Only turtles and crocodilians can do this. It's where the, the temperature of the eggs will determine the sex of the hatchling. So with turtles, it's uh, warm girls, warm, you know, warmer temperatures will get females cooler temperatures will get males. Crocodilians, it's reversed. So it's a little interesting. Now some other little biology things about them. Um, turtles have very, very good eyesight. Um, in fact, their eyesight is sometimes comparable to birds. They can see uh, colors extremely well. They can see more shades of red than we can. And it's also believed that they can see in the ultraviolet spectrum, very similar to the way the birds can. Their sense of smell is also incredible. They have a very, very good sense of smell. Now hearing, not too good. Uh, we know that they can hear vibrations like footsteps. So when you're walking along, the turtle can actually hear the vibrations. Um, whether or not they can hear airborne sounds is kind of debatable. Now we did learn some other interesting things about uh, their hearing that we'll talk about later, but it's kind of interesting. Now, <clears throat> How many are there? There's about 
361 species of turtles. Um, I said about because it's taxonomy. So, you know, one scientist might say there's four of this kind and another one might say there's two. So there are about 360 species in the world. Texas has 36 kinds. Now when I say kinds, that's species and subspecies. So counting these individual subspecies as, as a kind. Um, that is the second most diverse turtle population in the country. Second to Alabama. Surprisingly, most people would think Florida. Florida's uh, number three. And we actually just got a new species uh, last year on our list. So the diversity of turtles in Texas. We got a great diversity here. And so I love this state. You know, the diversity of turtles here is you know, second to one. Uh, we have just a quick rundown. Six sea turtles visit our shores. Uh, we have two snapping turtles, five different kinds of map turtles, three different kinds of cooters, and we'll talk about what a cooter is later. Three different box turtles, four mud turtles, five soft shells, and one tortoise. So here's the list. This is every single species of turtle that lives in Texas. Now I will talk about each one of these in detail. No, just kidding. A uh, couple notes on here. Uh, the western painted turtle, Prasimis picta, may be extirpated. Uh, these are found in mostly in far west Texas, like uh, west of Midland, kind of close to the uh, New Mexico border. We went out there last year to do a survey to see if we can find any, and the water is just has so many minerals, we couldn't really find anything living out there in any of the creeks, let alone turtles. So they might not be around anymore. Now this one, the Olive Ridley, this one is the new one that uh, was kind of exciting. Uh, this one actually, for the first time, this is mostly seen as a Pacific turtle, but they do nest in some Caribbean islands and parts of Florida. But we had a Olive Ridley wash up on uh, Mustang Island in 2019. So that actually pushed us over the uh, number that Florida has. So that's pretty cool. Um, this one here, the Chihuahuan mud turtle, it's listed as a subspecies, but it might be elevated to a species soon. That's something that's uh, being studied right now. All right, <clears throat> now what does the state think? Now, the state state loves to make it confusing. Um, they have some species that go down to the subspecies level, like the mud turtle uh, and the terrapin. They have those as subspecies. But then the box turtle, they have it listed as the eastern box turtle. But we really don't have what's called the eastern box turtle in Texas. They don't, in fact, live anywhere west of the Mississippi. We have the three-toed, which is a subspecies of this, but it might be a subspecies of the Mexican box turtle. New uh, genetic analysis kind of says it's more related to a Mexican box turtle than the eastern box turtle. They also don't have the ornate box turtle split. There's two different ornate box turtles. There's the ornate and the desert. We have both of them in Texas, but for some reason the state doesn't distinguish them. Uh, the ones in yellow here, these are ones that are state listed as threatened species. Uh, we do not have any endangered species listed by the state. All sea turtles are federally protected and three of those are, are endangered, um, but it's not a, there's not a state listing for endangered that's not the sea turtles. <clears throat> Now, one of the really cool things is endemism. We have four endemic kinds of turtles in Texas. And the really cool thing, all of them are found right here in Central Texas. So that's really, I mean, we're not only in the great state for turtles, we're in the best part of the state for turtles. Uh, so these are the four endemics that we have here. I'll go into each one of these. We'll talk a little bit more about them. But it's the Kegel's map turtle, Texas map turtle, Texas Cooter, and then the Guadalupe Softshell. So we'll start with the Kegel's map turtle. Um, these guys, these are really, map turtles are really cool. They're very, very dimorphic. This picture down here at the bottom is a mature pair. This one here is the female. Females can get about eight to nine inches. They have these massive heads because they eat a lot of uh, mussels and uh, uh, other shelled invertebrates. 
this little one right here, that's a mature male. Mature males are only maybe four to five inches. And these guys, their entire lives will just mostly eat aquatic invertebrates, uh, like dragonfly larva, dobson fly larva, uh, things like that. These guys are native to the Guadalupe River Basin. So they're found in the Guadalupe, Blanco, Medina, and San Marcos River. They are listed as being extirpated from the San Antonio River, but it's debatable or not whether or not they were really here. These guys kind of like clear flowing rivers. They like to riffle on the bottom. They like to hang out underneath uh, uh, the uh, black tree. What is that? Black willow. They like to hang out in the black willow roots. Those really aren't, there's not a lot of that. The habitat really isn't perfect for the uh, map turtles in the San Antonio River. So there's some debate on whether or not these guys actually ever lived in the San Antonio River or not. Now, these are state protected species as well. Um, so the other map turtle we got is the Texas map turtle. <clears throat> these guys are a little further north. They're in the Colorado River Basin. So they're in the Concho, Llano, Pernales, and San Saba rivers. Now the map here shows the counties where they have been recorded. Recorded means either through museum specimens, through observations, even iNaturalists. The red ones are observations. The green ones are, it's an observation, but they're not supposed to be there. This one is, um, your friend, uh, well, where have it right? Which county is that? I do have some notes, so. Per county, um, they're not supposed to be there. Uh, we had a survey earlier this year, and oops, we found three of them. Um, this is actually kind of a problem because it's, there's the possibility of them hybridizing with the Kegel's map turtle, which, like I said, is protected. And uh, we kind of did some research and found out that there is a uh, a rehabber in the area that was having turtles brought to her from wherever she wasn't documenting it and she was releasing them in the river. She didn't know what kind they were. She just, whatever turtles people brought to her, she lived near the river and she just dumped them in the river. So we think that that's how these turtles might have... Uh, been introduced. We looked at the geography of the area, and these two basins don't interact. There's a ridge line. If you go uh, north of here, right along north of I-10, that kind of acts like a continental divide. So all the rivers that form the Colorado River Basin will flow north into the Pardonales and eventually down to the Colorado. Everything that flows, everything south of I-10 will flow south. So there's no way that the turtles could have naturally moved into this other area. And like with the other, with the Kegel's map turtle, these things are also dimorphic where the, the females are a lot larger than the males. And that's because of, uh, you know, the diet changes. The females will eat a lot more harder things. Like I said, the mussels and snails and things like that, while the males stick with the aquatic invertebrates. Let me drink here. Texas Cooter. An interesting name. Uh, did some research on why they're called cooters. <clears throat> One of the uh, West African names for turtle is Kuta, uh, K U T A. So it is believed, you know, that name was kind of taken over in the South over time and translated to cooter. So, um, these are kind of like a river turtle. We have a few different species. I'm just going to talk about this one because this is ours, only in Texas. This Texas cooter lives nowhere else. And they're very, very common around here. Uh, Brazos, Brazos, Guadalupe, pretty much most of the rivers in central Texas. If you were to go to any body of water, especially in the San Antonio Bear County area, chances are very good you're gonna see one of these. Very, very common turtles. Um, while most cooters are river turtles, these guys are found in oxbows, lakes, ponds, golf courses, pretty much any standing body of water. Very good chances you're going to see one of these cooters in the area. Now, if you look at this picture here, their smile, and they got some vicious teeth. Well, not really teeth. 
turtles don't have teeth. These are just cusps on their, their beak. It looks vicious. You think, man, what does this thing eat? It's a plant eater. They have these nice little sharp cusps. Help them tear up vegetation. A lot of turtles will go through a transition, especially aquatic turtles where the juveniles will eat mostly aquatic insects. And as they grow up, they become a little bit more herbivorous. Same thing with these guys. The young tend to eat a lot of water bugs, things like that in the water. As they grow up, they become a lot more herbivorous, eating aquatic plants. Now, here's another. We have uh, the Guadalupe spiny softshell is another endemic. Now, the spiny softshell, the, the main species, is actually very common throughout the entire country. Uh, you can see here we have four different colors. Those are the uh, four different subspecies of the spiny softshell we have. The orange one is Spinifera spinifera, or the eastern spiny. Blue is Pallida, or the pallid spiny softshell. And then the green is the uh, Texas spiny, or MRI. So the red is uh, the Guadalupe spiny softshell. Once again, a very, very common turtle. If you go down, you, know, you walk uh, Mission Reach, you see those big soft shells. Those are the Guadalupe spinies. A lot of people, when they say, oh, I saw a really, really big turtle, like, did it look like a pancake? Yeah, okay, it's a soft shell. Now, these guys are also dimorphic. This picture over here, you see this really, really big turtle here. These guys, the females get big. They can get 15 to 18 inches long. It's kind of hard to see, but if you look right here to the back, that little bitty thing, that's a male, mature male. A mature male spiny soft shell, maybe six inches, maybe eight, very small. So they're about half the size of an adult female. Now the soft shells, most spiny, spiny soft shells and most other soft shells are mainly carnivorous. And these guys are also known for eating a lot of carrion. They'll eat dead fish. In fact, uh, Texas turtles, we published a natural history note in a journal, we actually saw a big female eating off of a deer carcass that was in a river. It was just floating deer, just floated nasty in the river. And it was a soft shell just picking pieces off of it. So as we'll talk a little bit later about what turtles are good for, there are river cleanups. They clean up a lot of the dead stuff in the water and soft shells are really good for doing that. So now we'll talk about some of the other I'm not going to go into every turtle in Texas. We'll be here way too long. Um, but I'll, I'll talk about some of the more enigmatic, some of the cooler species. And I'll try to focus on the ones that are in Central Texas. And the first one is, you know, the coastal. It's a ter diamondback terrapin. Beautiful, beautiful turtles. These are brackish water turtles. They live mostly in the estuaries and the bays along the coast. They don't really make it inland and they're not really found in the open water. So they're just right along the bays and the estuaries and in the, uh, some of the salt marshes along the coast. These guys mainly eat, you know, again, aquatic invertebrates, um, snails, small crabs, things like that. Pretty much any invertebrate in the water. Um, even though this called the Texas map turtle and you look at the map, it's like, hey, why is that not an endemic? They do range into Louisiana water. So, you know, oh well, we lost out another one. Now, these guys are um, in trouble. Terrapins all over. Terrapins range, as you can see down there on the southern part of the map from South Texas, and they'll go all the way around the Gulf Coast, all the way around Florida, all the way up the East Coast to New England. Uh, there's four or five different subspecies that go all the way up to New England. Um, these guys are commonly. Uh, collected for food. People ate them a lot, especially the New England ones. So their population really took a hit from being collected for food. Uh, fortunately, in Texas, you can no longer collect any turtle in Texas for commercial purposes. But uh, now what's uh, running, these guys are running into problems is they drown in abandoned crab traps. <clears throat> There's a, a couple surveys, or not surveys, a uh, volunteer events where you can go down to the coast and collect these abandoned uh, crab pots down there on the bay. Um, the main reason people want to do that is because the uh, terrapids will go in there just like the crabs, but they need air to breathe, so they drown in these crab pots. 
Um, and unfortunately, poaching is also a big threat to these guys. Uh, these turtles are very, very popular in Asia. Uh, not only as pet, uh, not only as food, but as pets. They're very, very high demand. So a lot of people are trying to collect these in the wild to sell for uh, for pets. And that's a, a problem turtles have. Which we'll talk about later. Uh, one of my favorite turtles. Actually, this is one of the ones that really got me into turtles. Three-toed box turtle. I have it listed here as Terrapane, Carolina. Uh, in fact, one of my buddies was on, wrote the, was one of the authors of the paper that said they're more aligned to the Mexican box turtles. That's just something different. Taxonomy stuff. These guys are native to Bear County, but it's a relic population. In fact, if you go on iNaturalist, there are only four observations of three-toed box turtles in Bear County. Um, you hear a lot, and you'll hear a lot of stories. Oh, you used to find a lot of them. You just don't see them anymore. Yeah, box turtles are taking a hit all over the country. Uh, pop, uh, they're losing habitat just like everything else, but a big thing with these guys is fragmentation. Um, and the fragmentation, unfortunately, is caused by roads. Building a road through their habitat, they go out on the road, cars hit them. And, you know, road mortality is a big risk for these guys. And they're also, you know, unfortunately, they're popular in the pet trade. They're collecting these by the dozens, hundreds sometimes, shipping them to Asia uh, for, for pets, too. So they're not eating them, but they're, they're you know, very high demand. They, I mean, these common turtles here, or we think they're common, they'll sell for hundreds of dollars a piece in China. So there's a very, very high demand, unfortunately. So a lot of our native turtles are being illegally captured and uh, smuggled uh, out of the country. Box turtles are omnivorous. So they, they really are, they will eat anything. Uh, they love earthworms. It's one of their favorite foods. Whenever you get a good rain, the worms come out, box turtles will run around eating the worms, but they'll also eat different kinds of berries, fruits, leaves, other insects. In fact, I have I have a group of box turtles here. Um, I saw one eating a, a woolly bear, a little uh, leopard moth larva, the caterpillars. Saw one of them eating that the other day. That was kind of an interesting observation. So these guys are omnivorous. You can see that they are uh, mostly East Texas. They are further east, and they actually do go north quite a ways too, into uh, I think almost all the way up to Illinois, maybe even Michigan. But uh, as far as east they go, pretty much to the Mississippi. Now the other two box turtles we have, these are a little bit more, more common, but they're still in trouble. These are the uh, ornate and the desert box turtles. We have both of them in Texas. Uh, this picture right here, uh, you can see the difference between the two. The ornates are gonna have more, less stripes, but they're gonna be thicker. The uh, yellow on them is gonna be a thicker. The desert box turtles are going to have more stripes, but they're going to be a lot thinner. Uh, the other way you can tell <clears throat> is where you are. If you are west of the Pecos, it's going to be a desert box turtle. If you're anywhere else in the state, it's going to be an ornate. <clears throat> These guys are found in Bear County, but they're not very common. There's not a lot of observations for these guys. They're a lot more common further north and actually in the plains. That's one of their other names. Um, you'll see a lot of the herpetologists, especially we use scientific names a lot. These are also called plains box turtles because these guys are found right smack in the middle of the U.S. in the Great Plains. So there's a, a lot more in the, the grassy areas. And you can tell by the camouflage pattern that that's a good pattern to have if you're living in a grassy environment. And again, these guys are also omnivorous. They're a little bit more carnivorous than the three-toed box turtles. They do have a preference for animal matter. And that could be anything from, you know, like I said, insects to carrion and, and even the, the, the favorite that a lot of people really love hearing, coprophagic. They like to eat them. And uh, a lot of turtles do that, <clears throat> especially terrestrial turtles. It's a good way for them to get protein, especially if you eat a carnivore poop, because you can get a lot of calcium and protein in that. 
because, you know, as a turtle, it is kind of hard to catch protein. So, but it is something common that a lot of turtles do. And people that keep turtles and they say, oh, no, my turtle ate poop. It's like, yeah, it's normal. <clears throat> Yellow mud turtles. These guys were great this year. Usually you never see these guys. They're very, very widespread. They live pretty much throughout the entire central U.S. down in Mexico. But they're very, very hard to find. Unless you have a year like this year where it rains constantly. These guys will live in usually in very stagnant water, uh, not very, uh, very muddy, silty, sandy soil. And they'll burrow. They'll just lay in that mud. They'll eat aquatic invertebrates mostly. These guys are mostly carnivorous. And they don't really move around a lot. In fact, they'll even estivate underground or dig little chambers in the mud and the ponds will sometimes evaporate. These guys are found commonly in like cattle tanks. <clears throat> but when you have a year like this where you get a lot of heavy rain, they'll come out of those tanks and they'll wander quite a bit. They're actually pretty terrestrial for a water turtle. They do walk around a lot. So we were finding a lot of them this year crossing the roads, moving between different ponds and things like that. Um, usually, usually don't because of the weather, but on years like this where you get the heavy rain, uh, they do move around quite a bit. <clears throat> now there's some confusion on mud and musk turtles. So one thing I want you to look at here, this is the uh, plasteron or the belly of the mud turtle. See, it's a pretty solid shell. Um, it almost kind of looks like a box turtle. It's a very solid, it is hinged. They have a slight hinge right here. And then um, this is the shell, the plastron of a musk turtle. You see, it's a little bit smaller and they also have skin in between the scales. So the common musk turtle, this is probably one of the smallest turtles that live here. These guys mature, big male, maybe five inches, little turtle. Um, now, even though it's not marked, some of our maps haven't, we need to update. They are found here in Bear County. Um, these guys actually are pretty common. And this is another one that, you know, not a lot of people see until, you know, you're, you set out a crawfish trap. And then you get one in there. Uh, these guys actually show up a lot. If you buy a big bag of crawfish, sometimes you dump out the bag and there's a little turtle in there. Um, that comes up quite frequently. It's usually these guys. They like, once again, stagnant water, swampy water, you know, things like, you know, where you would expect to find a crawfish too. But they're also found in uh, other areas, rivers and things like that. Uh, we're involved in a big study on uh, in the Comal River, right outside Orlando Park in New Braunfels. We're doing a population study on just all the turtles there. In the four or five years, just doing a small stretch of the river from pretty much from Landa Park north, I think, to the riverhead. We have over 2,000 individuals of this turtle. <clears throat> now, if you've ever been to this area, and you look in the water, you'll see all these little bitty snails. I can't remember the name of them, but it's an invasive snail. The bottom is like covered in these guys, in these snails. Well, the musk turtles that live there, we're finding they're showing up like this, these ginormous jowls. Normally it's like, you know, it's a pretty sleek looking turtle, but they're here in the Comal, they're building up these huge mandibles to eat the snails. These guys are mostly eating these invasive snails and they're getting so much, you can see it's actually building up over their eye. And we don't know if this is just plasticity, that they're just developing this, to be able to eat the snails better, or if it is really something genetic, if there is some heritable trait that it will that these turtles are able to pass down this gene where they can build up these large jaws to be able to eat the snails in the river a little bit better. So that's one of the things we're looking at in the study, but it's a very interesting observation that we're seeing with these turtles showing up in the Comal River right here, or just north of us in New Braunfels. We're gonna step out of uh, Central Texas, go down to the uh, river a little bit. The Rio Grande Cooter. It's another one, obviously, 
that lives in the Rio Grande. It is not endemic, unfortunately, because it also goes up into New Mexico. Now, one of the cool things with these guys, these are beautiful turtles. You can kind of see here uh, the bright yellow striping on their head. They'll sometimes get red stripes on their legs. They'll even get this, their shell, the older ones will get this red reticulated pattern on their shell. Beautiful turtles. One of the really cool things about them is they're huge population densities. We were in Laredo a couple of years ago doing a survey for these guys because the state was wondering, hey, should we protect these or how endangered are they? How many are? They just didn't know. We didn't know how many there were. So we went down to one spot near Laredo and I think we stopped counting at a, like 120 turtles. There were several, if you look at this picture here, I think I counted uh, 18, 20 turtles on this. There were multiples of these just covered in turtles. And it was all these Rio Grande cooters. So they're found you know, pretty much throughout the entire Rio Grande Valley. And they're just interesting because they do have these very, very large high population densities. Uh, like the Texas cooter, they are mostly herbivorous as adults. Young also eat insects and plants, but as they grow up, become adults, they uh, are mostly herbivorous. Wow, our native tortoise. A lot of, I'm surprised. A lot of people do not know we have a native tortoise. When I was both at San Antonio Zoo and Snake Farm. We would get people calling us and say, oh, I rescued a sulcato or an African spurred tortoise. Um, can we bring it to you? We're like, no, don't. And they show us a picture and it's, it's a Texas tortoise. They're native. They live here. A lot of people don't realize that. I'm kind of a, you know, it was one of my personal missions is to advertise, hey, there's a native tortoise. They're right here in Bear County. Um, and when I say they're in Bear County, I mean, some of the parks and the green belts, they live there. Uh, people will find them and think, oh, it's a lost pet. It's like, no, oh, they live here. They are native. They are found in this park. Um, so a lot of people will rescue them. They'll relocate them. And these guys, they're territorial. They know they're where they live, and that's where they live. And you move them, and they're going to try to go back. Um, if, they can't go, if they can't physically go back, they're going to wander, try to find a place to live. There might not be enough food, the right kind of food. Or it could be someone else's territory living there, and they get beat up by the other tortoise. Male tortoises are very, very aggressive. You see a lot of these videos of, you know, the altruistic tortoise where they roll their buddy over and save them. What most likely happened before that video started is that same tortoise actually knocked the other one upside down and would just keep on pounding on them and hitting them and hitting them. These guys are very, very aggressive, especially the other males. That's when they have this little guler scoop, these little uh, projections underneath their head. They will use that scoop and actually try to get up under the tortoise shell of the other tortoise to flip them over with that. It's like a little mini forklift. Um, so they're not altruistic at all. These guys don't save their buddies. They will, in fact, ram them, male or female. They're going to try to mate with them. They're going to mount them. They're not friendly with other tortoises. In fact, you know, like I said, their physiology is, you know, we have a tool to flip other tortoises. That's what these guys do. Um, these green in the counties, these are um, anomalies that are probably released pets, released turtles, released pets. I hear a lot of uh, people say, well, I've had these, or my grandmother had these before they were illegal, so they're grandfather. I talked to the state herpetologist, and he said that doesn't exist. These things are protected. You cannot own a Texas tortoise, period, without a permit. Do not have a permit. You cannot have one. Now, sometimes they happen to live in your backyard. That's kind of a gray area, but as long as you are not, like, taking care of it and it's not a pet, these guys, it is illegal to own one of these in the state. So keep that in mind. You know, a lot of people have these or they think they're sulcatas and they're because they found one, they you know found one crossing the road or found one in a park in town, and then they rescue it, and then no, it lives there. You know, just leave it alone. Help it across the road. Um, these guys are important because you know they eat a lot of the cactus, and uh, they eat prickly pear fruit, and they've actually determined that the uh, seeds hatch or the seeds 
uh, sprout better once they've gone through a Texas tortoise than without. So, kind of interesting. Ah, the famous red ear slider, the dime store turtle. These guys are notorious. Most uh, turtle biologists in the world, I said, in the world, when you mention red ear slider, they cringe. I actually have a friend who's a turtle biologist in India. And we posted a picture of this beautiful red ear we found. And I said, hey, yeah, we marked her and released her. She's like, why'd you release her? It's like, it's okay. They're native here. These turtles, the red ear slider is top 10 of one of the most invasive species in the world. Not invasive turtle, invasive species, period. These guys live on every continent except Antarctica. They're on islands, they're in Hawaii, they're in Borneo. I've seen them in Europe, I've seen them in Korea. They're all over the country, all over the US, all over Europe, Asia, Africa, South America. They're a huge problem in India, but they're native here. They live here, so it's okay. So we find these, and they are beautiful turtles. They are terrible pets. Do not keep these as pets, unless you have like a big pond outside. They're messy turtles. They need a lot of filtration. They get big. And, you know, adult female will get about 15 inches. So these are big turtles. Um, terrible pets. Leave them out there in the wild. They're native here. Enjoy them in the wild. You don't have to feel bad about looking and seeing them. <clears throat> Another cool thing about it, and it causes a lot of confusion, is the males change color as they grow up. They turn black. These here, these are females. These are mature females. Obviously, this one here, this one's nesting. Uh, but this is a mature female. They keep their color. They'll keep that, that red stripe behind the eye, name red ear. <clears throat> this is a mature male, solid black turtle. So we get a lot of people will say, wow, I found this rare all black turtle. Like, no, it's just a male red ear. But it doesn't have the red ear. Well, it's male red ear. They become melanistic. The red ears and the cooters, they'll, uh, the males will change colors. They'll develop some kind of a, they'll get darker. The cooters, like I said, will get kind of a reddish reticulate pattern. The, uh, the red ear sliders, the males will turn black. And sometimes the shell will even become so dark, it turns gray. So you'll see like a gray turtle with like a black outlines around the scoots. Um, there's nothing wrong with this, not anything special, just the old male red ear slider. So, but they're here, very, very common. This is the other turtle. If you go to any park around San Antonio and you see turtles basking, it's either going to be a Texas cooter or a red ear slider. Almost guaranteed. You're going to see one of these two turtles at pretty much any aquatic park or any park that has water in the area. <clears throat> Here's another special one for me, the Kemp's Ridley Sea Turtle. I actually started volunteering with these guys when I was in junior high. Um, they had, there was a Head Start facility and I can do an entire, and I have done presentations on these guys. Um, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail on their history, um, but there was a Head Start program for these guys. They were raising them up in Galveston for a year um, and then releasing them when they were a little bit bigger. So they're at a point where not everything could eat them. Because when they hatch, you know, the little baby babies, everything eats them. Um, but it is the official state sea turtle of Texas. I do, uh, I have been volunteering. I haven't been for the past couple of years for various reasons. <clears throat> COVID. Um, down at the coast to uh, uh, monitor and look for the population, look for them nesting. This picture here is, looks like a nice picture of the beach. Are you all looking on your phones? It's going to be really hard to see. But you look right here, it's a nesting female. So these guys are really hard to find nesting. You think, how can you not see a turtle nesting? Believe it or not, you know, they have good camouflage. You can look at the color of the shell, matches the sand pretty well. Um, and they're small sea turtles. You know, this actually it is the smallest sea turtle in the world. And sadly, it's also the most endangered. Now, these guys have an interesting history. Up until 1947, we didn't know where these guys nested. In fact, it was they were jokingly called the bastard turtle because they thought they were a hybrid between greens and loggerheads because they never saw where they nested. Um, and when they were found in 1947 on one beach, they nest mainly on one beach in Mexico. 
there were an estimated 40,000 turtles nesting at one time on one afternoon, 40,000, 1947. By, by the mid 1980s, there were only about 800 nesting females. So in less than 40 years, we went from over 40,000 nesting on one moment to less than 800 total. Well, I think it was like 803, about 800 total. So these guys took a big hit. Uh, they were collected heavily for meat uh, and also for their eggs. And then unfortunately, the uh, shrimp nets also took their toll on these turtles. Fortunately, they are now protected both in the US and Mexico. Uh, we set up in a secondary nesting beach on Padre Island, uh, both Padres, North and South Padre. And fortunately they're doing, they're coming back. They're doing pretty good. Uh, there's still only a large Arribada or where these mass gatherings for these nesting turtles in Mexico, maybe 10,000. Uh, on North Padre, a good year will be over a hundred nesting for the entire year. So uh, we're working on getting them back. They're still, you know, it looks like they're doing good, but you know, considering there were 40,000 at one point and now there's maybe 10,000 nesting at a time, still got a long way to go. Uh, the fact that we have, um, they're called turtle excluder devices on tripping nets is helping. Basically a little box or a slit in the net where the shrimp, can go through this, the, it's like a filter and there's a little flap and the turtle hits the guard and the turtle can pop out. And uh, that actually saves a lot of turtles. And it also prevents a lot of bycatch. So a lot of the big fish and anything else that gets into the turtle net can actually get in there and squish up and mess up a lot of the shrimp, decrease the value of the shrimp. These uh, turtle excluder devices prevent a lot of the big stuff from getting in there. And then shrimpers have better quality fish, with better quality shrimp. That's why if you, you know, you buy shrimp, make sure it's golf call because we have all the states are required to use these excluder devices on their shrimp nets. Um, the other interesting thing I brought up, the olive ridley, mostly considered a Pacific turtle, but we did have one show up. Unfortunately, it was already, it was a, a stranding, so it was not alive or it was alive, but soon passed um, on Mustang Island. They do occasionally, come into the Gulf, but not very uh, frequently. <clears throat> the other cool thing about the Kemp's, this is a Gulf turtle. They lived in the Gulf of Mexico. That's really it. Every now and then, one <laughs> it's kind of funny or sad for them. They'll get out around Florida and get caught in the Gulf Stream and <laughs> head up the coast. And they'll find them stranded sometimes in like Boston area. And very rarely you'll hear about one that ends up off the coast of Scotland. And the water's too cold. For them up there but they get caught in the gulf stream kind of like finding nemo and just before they know it they're in england and they're usually cold stunned and they got to ship them back to the u.s to get better and then we release them back here in gulf water they're in nice warm gulf water all right the snapping turtle uh this is what i like to call the water moccasin of turtles because everyone who sees a turtle in the water it's a snapping turtle. It had its mouth open. Now, they are here though. They are very common. Um, and yeah, they, you know, they do live up to their name. They do snap. Um, it was kind of funny to say it's a dangerous turtle, but you know, a big, big one of these um, can, you know, take off a finger. Um, it has been documented before. They cannot, they break broomsticks. They're not that strong. You ever try to break a broomstick? I mean, solid wood, you really can't do it. It's hard. Um, but a small stick, twig, finger, yeah. Um, there are a lot of other misconceptions about them. Yeah. One of the funny stories I've heard is like, you know, skinny dippers, uh, sometimes snapping turtles will bite the dangly bits. Yeah, I don't think that's possible, but they are predators. I have seen, I have witnessed them take down ducklings. Um, they will attack adult ducks, drag them under, eat under, eat underwater. Um, some people also will tell you they can't bite underwater. That's not true. Um, so they are predators, but they also do eat a lot of carrion. They will eat dead fish, dead birds, dead animals that are in the water. They you know, are part of the cleanup crew. 
Now, you do see these guys wandering a lot. They do come out of water. They do bask. They do uh, walk quite a bit. They'll go between ponds and rivers. Um, and if you see one crossing the road, you know, be careful picking them up. Do not pick it up like a traditional turtle because they have a very long neck and they can and will reach around and grab your hand. So if you do, don't grab them by the tail either. Remember, that's their backbone. It's not a handle. They don't have a real prehensile tail, so you can actually uh, damage your spine and cause partial paralysis. Um, if you do want to pick one up or you have to, go from the back underneath, kind of grab their little shell underneath the back, and then hold on to the tail, but not like lift with the tail, just kind of scoop them from the back. Recommended to have gloves. These guys, you know, they do have a pretty serious bite, so you don't want to get bit by one of these guys. Um, they are big. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, not everything is big in Texas. These guys are pretty small for snapping turtles down here. Um, and called Bergman's Rule. Hopefully somebody here knows what a Bergman's Rule is. Bergman's Rule is animals that live up north in the cold tend to be a little bit bigger, have more body mass than the ones down in the south and the warmer. So like, that's why you always see the really, really big deer up in Wisconsin. Same thing with the snapping turtles. Snapping turtles up north. And these guys can live in the up north into Canada. Um, you get over 50, sometimes maybe even up to 60 pounds. The ones down here, 25 pounds, maybe 30. A really, really big one. So they don't get as big as the ones up north. But I mean, still a 15 inch turtle that's got a bad attitude. It's uh, still pretty fun. As you can see, range wise, pretty much found throughout most of the state. Um, they are very common here. Texas, I've seen them at many uh, lakes, ponds, rivers around the area. So they are pretty common here in a uh, Bear County area. Now, what isn't common, and you'll hear stories, you know, people swear they see these guys. I hear so many people tell me, there's alligator snappers in the Comal. Watch out. No, there's not. They're not here. These guys are east, east Texas. <clears throat> east to uh, Florida. Now these guys are big. They are very big turtles. Um, you look at this one here. This is the famous El Gigante. Caught him on a, a survey we were doing in uh, Houston. The largest recorded captured alligator snapping turtle in Texas. 138 pounds. You see his holding hands. He was very scared. They're holding hands at a moment. Big turtle. Now, remember I was talking about we're learning new things about turtles? This is one, this is a perfect example of the new things we're learning. We expected these guys to live in pristine swamps, you know, Okefenokee, you know, Atchafalaya Basin. A few years ago, somebody found a dead one off Buffalo Bayou near Memorial Park in downtown Houston. So we're like, hmm, I wonder how many are down there. So we started trapping. We found, and we found more, more. Right now we're up to, I think 103 individuals in a five mile stretch, Buffalo Bayou in off Memorial Park near downtown Houston. The fourth largest city in the world. And if you've ever been to Buffalo Bayou, it's nasty. It's in downtown, so everything that's in the streets in downtown Houston goes into Buffalo Bayou. I grew up in Houston. You know, I always know the story, you know, you don't even want to touch the water in Buffalo Bayou. You know, it's, it's that bad. But these giant predatory turtles are living there. And there's a lot of them. Hundred, over 105 mile stretch of the river. Well, it's blown away. They recently did a publication on these guys. And we're finding juveniles too. We haven't found any hatchlings yet, but we have found some small ones. Um, but we're finding these guys, you know, they have a very, very good population, very dense population density. We were, uh, we did another survey uh, further north of Beaumont at a resort community. They told us, yeah, there's a whole bunch here. We went out there and did, set a couple traps. Within two days, we found nine. Just out of like three or four traps over a weekend, nine of these. The biggest one we found was like 80 pounds. Um, so these are big turtles. These are also dimorphic, but they're the other way around. The males 
or bigger. Uh, a large male in captivity has been reported over 200 pounds. A uh, female, 60 pounds is, is a big female. So the females are a lot smaller than the males. Now, why is there confusion? I see I'm getting close to my time. Why is there confusion? I always say, because of the ridges. People see ridges and think, oh, it's an alligator snapping turtle because common snapping turtles have flat shells. Nope, common snapping turtles have ridges too. They're not as big, they don't stick up as big as these guys, but they do have them. This is a common snapping turtle. <clears throat> this is a baby common snapper. This is a baby alligator snapper. They look very similar. Easiest way to tell the difference is the head. Look at the head. Alligator snappers will have a disproportionately large head, even as adults. They can't tuck their head in. Part of the reason why they got that attitude is because they really can't defend themselves out of water. Um, they just have the shell. Plastron is very small. They can't bring their heads in. The other cool thing with alligator snappers is famous lure. Can't really see it, but it's like right here on the front of their mouth. They have a, a their tongue is like a little worm. Sit there and wiggle and wiggle. And that fish will say, hey, look at that. I get some food. Tom. Now the fish is food. So that's a really cool thing. So these guys are actually pretty sedentary. The uh, common snapping turtles will move a lot. They translate a lot. Um, they've done genetic studies on common snapping turtles, and they found pretty much from here all the way up to Canada, there's very, very little genetic variation. Um, these guys are very, very genetically similar. And we think it's part of that because they move around so much, they don't have isolated populations. <clears throat> one of the other cool things we learned about alligator snappers is we thought there was only one species. Now we know there's two. There's another species from uh, uh, very North Florida, Southern Georgia. Let me move on. Quick, we do have introduced turtles. We do have turtles that live here that aren't supposed to be here. Don't know what they're invasive yet because we don't know if they're actually reproducing. Um, yellow belly spider. This is a cousin of the red ear. It's a different subspecies. Uh, these guys are really common. You'll find these in a lot of lakes. Um, the African spurred tortoise, the cicada. These guys bust out of enclosures, houses a lot. You'll see a lot of people reporting these missing. Sometimes they'll get out, get out, and people will find them. There are actually uh, 11 observations for African spurred tortoises on iNaturals. Uh, this is probably the most common uh, identification for iNaturalists. This one, the yellow belly spider, doesn't count because it counts in when the red ears. So there's uh, 38 observations for uh, Florida red belly sliders or red belly cooters in Texas. And this is a Russian tortoise, it's a very small tortoise. These are the ones you find in the pet stores a lot. Uh, there's uh, five observations for Russian tortoises in Texas. And like I said, as far as we know, none of these are reproducing yet. All right. <clears throat> and now, uh, gotta hurry through the important stuff. Why, why do turtles matter? I tried to touch on it earlier. Um, they're in trouble. 61% of all turtle species are either threatened or endangered more than any other invertebrate group in the world. There's one species of turtle in Asia. There are three, not 300, 3,000, three individuals. That's it. These guys are in a lot of trouble. Many, many reasons, like every animal on earth, habitat loss is huge. Collection for the pet trade, food trade, habitat fragmentation, road mortality, climate change. Not only is climate change going to affect where they can live. Remember I talked about how they are temperature sex determinant. Former turtles when they're incubated become females. We're seeing this already with sea turtles where there are more females hatching than males. We're going to get if the temperatures keep increasing like it's expected to, we might get to a point where no male turtles are hatching because of the way it's set up or the way the cooler temperatures are for males, warmer ones are for females. So we're already seeing this happen with sea turtles right now where majority of sea turtle clutches are all females. 
And uh, you're, we're starting to find some other populations where it's getting hard to find males. There's just not a lot of them out there. There's a whole bunch of females. Some of the Asian uh, pox turtles are, are showing this. Um, so that's one of the unusual threats of climate change is we're gonna run out of boy turtles. Some of the other things, you know, I talked about, you know, I'm gonna go real quickly on why turtles matter. And I get, sadly, I get this question a lot. I used to do rattlesnake conservation, man, that was a hard sell. Con turtle conservation is much easier. A lot of people like turtles. Most of the people that don't are either fishermen because they, they catch, they, you know, they mess up their catch or uh, golfers. Golfers don't like turtles because they dig on the greens and all that. <clears throat> turtles, like I said, you know, they, they eat a lot of carrion. They're, they're the, uh, one of the cleanup crews for the water. Um, a lot of turtles are keystone species. Um, the gopher tortoise in the Southeast, their burrows uh, are used by over 300 species of animals. So, you know, they're very important. One example, I uh, couldn't find where it was from, but uh, uh, diamondback terrapins were taken out of an ecosystem, out of an environment. Snails turned it in from a nice gra uh, grassland to a, a salt marsh in less than eight months because there were no turtles there to control the snail population. So a very good paper, if you want to look it up, uh, Jeffrey Lovich et al., where have all the turtles gone and why does it matter? The whole paper, it talks about a lot of different reasons on why turtles are important and why turtle conservation is important. So on that, one thing we're trying to encourage is, you know, going turtling, the new birding. Like I said, you know, there's lots of spots in San Antonio where you can go look at turtles. Here's, here's a short list. I'm not going to read it. Y'all can read. Um, there's lots of great spots in this area. And like I said, pretty much any body of water in this area is going to have turtles. All these pictures you see here are from one of these spots in the San Antonio area. Um, you want to get a little adventuresome, go up to Johnson City. You can actually see three of the endemics in the same spot. Or if you want to go down to the coast, go down to uh, Packery Channel, and you can actually see green turtles browsing on the algae. <clears throat> what are some other things you can do to support turtle conservation? I had to put this meme in here. This is so sad. It's funny. See the girl here, you know, all happy. These are the sea turtles. Sea turtles get all the attention. There are so many sea turtle conservation organizations. You watch a show, a documentary that has reptiles, they're going to show sea turtles, you know, and they get all the money. And then you look at this little freshwater turtle and tortoise conservation guys you know, trading for water. No, we don't get any. You know, I was looking in the U.S. There are mainly two groups that do freshwater turtle and tortoise conservation in the U.S. Turtle Survival Alliance and Turtle Conservancy. And they do stuff all around the world, but with mostly freshwater turtles and tortoises. Just in the South Texas Gulf Coast, there are at least five groups that work with sea turtles. So that's kind of the, you know, the challenge us freshwater turtle biologists have is, you know, we got to fight sea turtle people. Um, being master naturalist, educate the public about the plight of turtles. You know, these guys really don't make good pets. These are long lived animals. You're gonna get one of these turtles as a kid and you're gonna put it in your will. I got one when I was eight years old. I still have it. He's in my backyard. I've had him for over 40 years and he's doing great. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm. Um, beach, lake cleanups, I'm not getting into the pollution, plastic, you guys know all this, but these are great. You know, it helps turtles because they're out there too. You know, all of our, you know, rainwater washes all the stuff into the rivers. Our rivers are dirty. You know, the, all these river cleanups. Supporting turtle conservation organizations, I talked about too. Texas Turtles, we, you know, we're a small nonprofit. We would love any support. We got a great website. Got pictures, range maps of all the turtles in the state. We got a good active group on Facebook. Uh, TexasTurtles.org. Um, another thing, don't buy wild turtles. They they got enough trouble. There's a lot of captive bred. If you want a turtle as a pet, buy a captive bred one. And you know, even in the U.S., there are some turtle products that are for sale. But if you go overseas, you can find them a lot often. Don't buy them. And then you know, help them across the road. They need our help. You know, if you see one, 
safely, you know, watch out for cars, just move it in the direction it was facing. That's it. So on that, you know, I think we went seven minutes over. We'll open this up for questions. See if we got any, I see some chat popping up. Uh, uh, any questions yeah. going? Yeah, questions. We've got some questions. Um, All right. A lot of them you answered in your talk, um, you know, about helping turtles cross the road and, mm -hmm. and how to do that and how to be safe. Um, I was curious about the pet trade. Um, okay. You said that in Texas, it is illegal to trap or harvest turtles commercially now. Right. Does that just mean as a food source or does that mean, um, is that- You cannot catch a turtle in Texas and sell it for any reason. Okay. Whether or not you're gonna eat it, whether you're gonna make a pair of boots out of it, whether you're gonna make a drum, whether you're gonna have it as a pet. You cannot catch a wild turtle in Texas and sell it for any reason. Okay, so um, can people be sure when they do um, purchase, like say a red-eared slider from um, a pet store, how, how can they be sure that that's a captive bred animal? It's really the seller's responsibility to make sure that they are selling right. because it is not, the way the law is written is commercial. So you cannot make money off of them. You cannot sell them. Um, there are going to be unscrupulous vendors out there. There are going to be unscrupulous people that are going to sell it. Right. So basically, um, stay stay off the black market if you're yeah. interested. Um, the, the big chain stores, those are, the red ear sliders are going to be farm raised. Right. The tortoises they sell, those are all wild caught, but they're not native. Um, another thing with turtles is you can sadly tell if it's been in captivity for a while or not. Um, the development of the shell really requires a turtle to be outside. They require the UV light. Uh, they require the humidity. So if you see a turtle that's kind of lumpy, like the shell is a little really bumpy, that turtle's likely been in captivity for a while. <clears throat> we'll find that at a lot of the parks we go to, a lot of the urban parks. We'll catch a red ear, even though they're native, you'll look at it and the shell's real bumpy. We're like, yeah, you were somebody's pet that they dumped in the pond. Um, right. So you can kind of tell if the turtle's been in captivity or not. Um, the, the foreign, I didn't, I didn't want to go into the pet trade a lot because that's a whole other non-naturalist thing. But there's also the four inch rule uh, where you can't buy a turtle under four inches because of salmonella, because you know kids would play with the turtles and then they stick their fingers in their mouth. You know, you can get salmonella from everything. This simple rule is you touch any animal, don't stick your fingers in your mouth, wash your hands. Um, but because of that, there's a rule you can't buy turtles under four inches. But yeah, you can still buy them. Right. So, but it's an FDA rule. So it's not a game in fish. It's not a parts of wildlife rule. It's actually an FDA law. So finding okay. somebody to enforce that is right. kind of hard. So. Right. Um, well, speaking of turtles as pets, we did have a participant who is curious um, as to the best produce to feed um, your red-eared slider, say? Um, just like us, variety and uh, moderation. Okay. Uh, if it's a baby, spinach is not good because spinach binds with calcium and it removes, prevents you from being able to use the calcium. But in oh, adults, wow. it's fine. So moderation, don't feed it just one thing. It's like, especially lettuce, because they really love lettuce. And they'll just eat lettuce and it's like candy. So they'll yeah. just eat it and they won't eat anything else. So, you know, variety, mix it up. The greens are all good. You know, frozen shrimp, fish. I even feed my turtles. I'll get like uh, <clears throat> whiting, the whole whiting. HEB sells whole whiting. You can get like two or three of them for like three bucks. Turtles will eat that. You know, they're omnivorous. So, you know, variety. Mix it right. up. Don't give them just one pellet. Don't give them just one kind of fish. Uh, don't give them just one kind of green. Mix it up, you know, just like us. Same sure. thing, variety and moderation. Sure. Um, somebody else has written uh, about the problem with kids catching turtles, even 
killing turtles, uh, specifically in Green Line Park. Um, and they say that there's a catch and release fishing at this park. Um, and people hook the turtles. They're wondering who has jurisdiction over that. So would that be an FDA? Um, no. Or would it be U.S. Fish the, and Wildlife? The FDA thing, they, they, don't, they don't enforce it. Um, yeah. Uh, if there's an issue, uh, contact the game warden. Game warden. Local game okay. Wardens. Okay. Um, they are considered a non-game animal, but because they are protected um, for commercial harvest, um, you can't catch them. And yeah, a lot of people, they'll hook them in, you know, either they'll just, you know, the nice ones will try to remove the hook. Um, and it's always a good idea to remove the hook because we'll actually find um, an alligator snapping turtle, a big one that's dead. And we do the necropsy and there was a hook in the stomach and it got infected and it died right. from the hook. So right. you don't want to just cut the hook off and let it go. Cause that's right. still, it's going to kill the turtle in the long run. Try wow. to get the hook removed. If you can't, you know, try to find a veterinarian who can do it, but obviously right. don't, you know, just cut the head off and throw it back in the water. <clears throat> right. I haven't heard much about it anymore. When I was, a, when I was younger and I know a lot of the, uh, the older generation, you know, you would hear of turtle planking. Unfortunately, this is a horrific hobby that a lot of kids used to do, where they would just basically get BB guns and 22s and just shoot basking turtles. Wow. Um, you don't hear about that as much anymore, unfortunately. Yeah. But uh, that, especially on the country, is still kind of a thing. But fortunately, not a lot of people are doing that anymore. But yeah, I've been to a lot of urban parks where, you know, you'll see dead turtles that have the string sticking out of their mouth. Yeah. So, so if, if you it, can catch if it, bring it up. If you can't get it out, you know, try to take it to a veterinarian or contact one of the wildlife refuges. So refuges if, if, if this is an ongoing problem, specifically in one park, like Green Line Park, um, that person could contact the game warden, the local game yes, warden. Yes, contact your game warden. Any, any wildlife issues, if you see people just, you know, wantonly killing animals, yeah, just contact the game warden. Okay. All right. Well, that's really great to know. Um, we have a specific question about uh, Kegley turtles and if they are found in Cibolo Creek. I don't think so. Okay. Very good question. I'll look into that. Um, I don't think they are. I think Cibolo okay. Creek is too uh, intermittent because um, okay. it does dry up quite a bit and it's just like there'll be sections of it. These guys really need the, the moving water. So they're found in the, the bigger ones. I'm not going to, don't quote me on it, but I don't think they are in Cibolo Creek. Or they shouldn't be. Somebody might have put one in there, but um, right. they should not be in the, the smaller creeks. They're mainly in the big rivers. It's a good question. Okay. I'll look into it. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> does anybody else have any questions for Sal here? Yes. I do. Uh, first of all, the the uh, what was the the species that you mentioned there, and, and asking about Bernie? What what species of turtle were you referring to? For Bernie? Yeah, the, I thought you said something about the the the, the uh, Cibolo Creek. Oh, the Kegel's map turtle. They were wondering if it was in Cibolo Creek. Oh, okay, okay. I don't think it is. Yeah. The areas I've been to on Cibolo Creek are not, uh, there's usually not enough water flow constantly to maintain a, a full time turtle population. I've seen red ears and I've seen cooters in them, but they will, they will transverse, they'll get out and walk. Uh, Matt turtles really don't do that. I've seen uh, turtles in their dammed portion of the creek, you know, that's in yeah. town. Yeah. Yeah. Those are probably uh, cooters and red ears. Yeah, I think so. And you might even find soft shells occasionally and and, or, and snapping turtles. But yeah, you'll find cooters and red ears you'll find in, uh, you you pretty much go to any body of water, there's going to be one of, one of those two turtles in there. Uh, I've even seen like, you know, in Cibolo Creek, actually, uh, you know, it was probably, you know, 20 yards across and there were two turtles in there. So, but they're there. Thank so, uh, of course, um, anyone that might have any more questions can always contact 
you guys, Texas Turtles, right? Right, texasturtles.org. We have the email okay. address. Like I said, there's also a Facebook group. If you just search search groups for Texas Turtles, um, you know, we got uh, people from all over the state doing IDs. We don't do pet stuff. We don't want to talk about pet issues there. Sure. We're not a, a pet group. Right. We're, we're there to talk about the natural history. So if you find a turtle, we'll ID it for you there. Um, but uh, if you want to know how to take care of it, you know, there's other groups. For okay. Um, well, Sal, you mentioned that uh, in a few weeks, you, you'll be looking for volunteers to help with your count. So if you wanted to share that information with us, we could get that up on our Facebook page for our okay. members and volunteers. Yeah, it was, yeah, I'll, I'll uh, put an announcement out. Some people Great. have already contacted me. Um, I'm just waiting for the weather to cool down a little bit. You know, this hot weather, the turtles aren't very uh, interested in looking for food going into the traps. So yeah. We'll set traps and we won't get any turtles. So it's not uh, August is uh, not, a, we usually don't trap in August just because we're not going to, not going to catch anything. So sure. we're going to wait. I'm going to wait till it starts cooling off a little bit. I mean, that's a great thing with Texas. I mean, you can find aquatic turtles active in January and February. Even after yeah. that big freeze, a week after that big freeze, I saw turtles out basking. Wow. Wow. So they're here. They're, they're, you know, they're, you can see them year round. Well, make sure uh, you get in touch with us so that we can disseminate well, that volunteer opportunity for everybody. And um, I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much. I learned such incredible things watching this tonight. Oh, well, I hope, hope it was a little entertaining too. Hope, hope <laughs> it was. So hopefully it next was. time I'll get to do one live and I can actually bring some like real turtles. Yes. Turtles yes. So y'all. Right. So, we're, uh, we're all looking, close. we're all looking forward to that day. That's for sure. Um, just so you know, you're getting a, a lot of uh, shout outs and thank yous on the chat. Uh, we really appreciate you doing this for us tonight. Yeah, I this enjoyed was, it. I, you this know, was I, great. I, I love talking about turtles. So whenever, you know, someone wants, someone wants to talk about turtles, you know, I, say, right. I could, I could keep going and going and going. And right. Right. Yeah. Noise, I noise yeah. my wife to no end when I start talking about turtles. And <laughs> don't care <laughs> but, uh, right. thanks everyone for uh, paying attention and, and hope hope somebody enjoyed it got some out of this and uh go out and enjoy some turtles you know we got we got some cool ones here go out and enjoy them take pictures let's see them